So tonight we're going to be discussing World Mission Society Church of God, and uh, we have Kelsey Wells and uh, and um, and then Steve Matthews, who uh, is kind of our resident expert on on the subject. On this channel, we like to focus on Jesus and the gospel and kind of make a B run for those things. There's a lot of like rabbit trails uh, that you can go down rabbit holes, sorry, um, that you can go down when you talk to members of these groups. Um, and it's very easy for them to kind of just wind you up like a pretzel and get you bouncing around from topic to topic, especially if they don't like the direction that one topic's going. They'll just kind of quickly bounce off and say like, hey, well, what about this? and get you going down a whole nother thing that's kind of on a tangential issue that's not really important. Steve, give us an overview of this group and kind of what they believe and why we should, why, we, why we're talking about them. Absolutely. The World Mission Society Church of God is a South Korean group. Started in, uh, they try to say 1964, it's really 1985. We can get into that a bit. But um, it's a very aggressive group. You're going to encounter them more and more. A lot of people make the mistake think it's still about more Jehovah's Witnesses, but newsflash, there's a lot of other groups out there. And this one, uh, I'm fearing a lot about these guys that they're going to pass Jehovah's Witnesses and get more and more millions. Right now, they're claiming 3 million. They're claiming to be in 175 countries. Um, they're very, very well trained. This is a new group, so we got to give answers to them. The difficulty is as a, gr a new group comes out, you know, it takes a while for the church to figure out, you know, responses and answers. So there's not that much information out there. And, uh, you know, we've been working at it and we're coming up with more and more answers, uh, you know, breaking new ground. And uh, we want to get the truth out there for people. So a lot of people watching this that might have a relative in there and they might be very discouraged. You know, they're coming home for the holidays. They don't want a Christmas tree in the house or they're going to argue and you know, talk about how they're part of Babylon and that kind of thing. But, you know, we want to definitely give an answer um, to what's in there. Uh, well, let's so. have Kelsey introduce herself. So, so hi, uh, my name is Kelsey. I'm a former member of the World Mission Society Church of God. I was a member for 10 years from 2007 until the end of 2017. Um, and I, you know, I attended um, two different branches of this church, the Seattle and the Portland Church. Um, and I've done everything from um, being a co-young adult group leader to being in charge of the kids class and activities um, to being in charge of the, the teenagers on um, for the, the Portland group um, and also being a unit leader in, while I was in Seattle. So um, I completed all the course classes in the church. Um, I was in the discipleship program when I left. And, and yeah, so um, I was very active uh, within my 10 years, um, both with the group and even when I, I used to live a little bit far away from the church. So I would do a lot of um, the church activities like preaching and recruiting in the area that I lived in by myself. Um, so, so yeah, that's a little bit about my story. So a lot of people, even in apologetics, even people in the church still think it's about the Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses. And they're not getting, you know, that the fact there's a whole new breed of movement, you know, of the movements of these groups like this. I said last week, um, I'll repeat it again, 21 year old kids are not in mass rushing out and joining, you know, the Jehovah's Witnesses anymore. You know, why would you want to be part of a a uh, hiking control group when you can go out to the desert do burning man now with no accountability complete freedom that's the kind of stuff that's getting big now the secret and some of these things i tell people you know synchronicity and some of this you know pagan spirituality um there then they have some of these organized groups and the world mission society church of god is a group that's growing very quickly um it took the mormons 141 years to get to the three million people to jehovah's witnesses a little over 100 years to do it and these guys have done it in 35 years. Um, you know, they're growing very fast. They claim in 1998, they had only, you know, existing in South Korea in one country. And now they claim to be in 175 countries. And that's how fast did they do that. They did that in like 
15 years or 20 years. It's, it's, you know, they're out there very aggressive to be a global movement to preach the gospel uh, of Ansan Hong to the world. Um, this is why we should be concerned about them. It's not just about Mormons and Witness anymore. So this group is out on campuses. They're, they go by different names on campuses. They'll go by Seven Thunders or the Elohim Academy. They'll come to your door as the Elohim Academy. They won't always say, we're from the World Mission Society Church of God. Um, you'll, you'll see them doing volunteer efforts in their yellow shirts. And then you'll say, you know, which are you associated with the church? Oh, we're part of the We Love You Foundation. You know, they'll try to use that kind of, you know, like a lot of the Korean groups, you know, the Unification Church, the Moonies and the uh, Shinchanji and uh, the Providence, uh, J JMS. These groups, will, which is also the initials of the leader, interesting enough, right? But these guys will all, you know, try to, you know, do these kind of things. They're very high demand Korean groups. They, they control all your thinking, but they're growing very quickly. It's something the church we need to get answers to. And um, thank God that there's more and more information coming out there on it. So, you know, we need to be aware of it. It shows like this where we get to, to do this. And um, I just want to give a quick introduction on it before Kelsey shares a little bit of her testimony of how she was able to come out and come to Christ. Yeah, thank okay. you. Thank you, Steve. Um, yeah, so, I mean, as, as I mentioned before, you know, I was a member of the World Mission Society Church of God for 10 years. So from 2007 until the end of 2017, um, and, and, I, and I was very active in the church. I went from, you know, growing up, like I didn't, I didn't spend my, you know, my year, I didn't spend my growing up years in, in church. I didn't, you know, do Bible studies ever. I mean, my, my, my family, you know, my, my, on my dad's side, you know, background, they were actually Jehovah Witnesses. Um, but we never even, I mean, my immediate family, we never grew up with that kind of stuff. And so we had a Bible, but that was, that was basically it. And, um, when I was a kid, you know, my, my dad took us to, you know, vacation Bible school a couple of times, just as, you know, we didn't learn anything. It was just as a babysitting tool really. And so, um, but it's funny because like, even though I didn't grow up with religion, like I was, I was always kind of very interested in religion especially in high school, um, I had a friend who was uh, Muslim and he would organize, uh, he was a year older than me and then he graduated and then he came back under AmeriCorps and was working within the schools. And, um, you know, even though I went to a public school, the school itself was like, they, they, they taught us a little bit about religion, um, just not necessarily one religion. It was kind of, we learned a little bit about Islam little bit about um, Catholicism, a little bit about Hinduism, and even the Baha'i faith, actually. Like, I learned about the Baha'i faith and Baha'u'llah before I learned about Christianity, actually. So, um, so but I was, again, I was always really, you know, interested in religion, and um, I didn't, I didn't necessarily, you know, um, believe one was, you know, better than the other. Um, but one thing I did want to learn about was more about Christianity, because again, I was exposed the only kind of Christianity, and I don't even know if you can even consider it Christianity was Catholicism. You know, I was exposed to that, but not actually what, you know, mainstream Christianity believed. And so when I had, you know, graduated high school, um, I, you know, I moved to, um, I'm from Vancouver, Washington, just outside Portland, Oregon, and I moved to Seattle, um, to go to the University of Washington. And within two weeks of moving to Seattle, um, I was actually preached to from two members from the um, World Mission Society Church of God. And the funny thing is, is, you know, before they approached me within those two weeks, like I was really wanting to, to, to you know, to do a Bible study, to learn what, you know, to, to learn about the Bible. It was just my own curiosity, um, not because I necessarily like, you know, believed in it but you know it's just again i was interested in religion and i think even when i joined when i first started school i think i wanted my major to actually be something within religion and um so you know, I, so first two weeks within school that's when the school does all their like you know their clubs are out trying to promote get more members and so every single thing i came across any kind of bulletin or any kind of group it it just seemed like every single one of them you had to pay for a bible study and I was not about to pay for a Bible study, <laughs> broke college student, right? And so, um, so again, you know, within two weeks of moving there, um, you know, I didn't know anybody in Seattle. I didn't have any family, didn't have any friends. Um, so, um, 
you know, I was pretty susceptible, I was pretty susceptible to, to really anything. Um, and so one night about 10 PM, I was walking back from the library to my dormitory and, um, two members came up to me and they said, Hey, have you ever heard of God, the mother in the Bible? And, um, and I said, I said, no. Um, and they said, can do you have a few minutes? Can we show you through the Bible a couple of verses? And I said, yeah, sure. And so, cause I'm a, I'm a people pleaser. I, I will like, you know, I, I, it's hard for me to say no to people, even if I don't want to listen, but actually I was interested in listening. And so um, they showed me the, the verses that we mentioned before, Revelation 22, 17, spirit and the bride say come, Revelation 21 and Galatians 4, 26. And to me, because again, I didn't have any background in the, you know, going to church or, you know, studying the Bible. So to me, what they were saying made logical sense because they use the example of, you know, just as on this earth, you know, humans, animals, right? Everything needs, you know, a father and a mother in order to be born, right? So in the same way for our spirit, you know, we need a father and a mother. And I said, okay, I, I can, I can understand that. That makes sense. And again, you know, I see the word bride in the Bible and I was like, oh, yeah, it must be God, the mother. Right. And then I see Genesis 126 where God said, let us, that's clearly plural. Right. So again, because, because I didn't have any knowledge in, in the Bible and I didn't even look up these verses to understand what, you know, commentary, you know, other Christians had on these verses. Um, the only, the only person I, and I don't even think I mentioned this the first time, but, um, you know, the only person I actually consulted was my, my roommate's boyfriend who was coincidentally Mormon. And he's like, yeah, there's a God, the mother. Cause I think, I think some Mormons believe there's a God, the mother. And so, so that was the only, you know, immediate reference I had. So I was like, oh yeah, this makes total sense. So I gave, you know, I gave the, the two WMS COG members, my number. Um, and they were, um, they were on a mission trip from the Los Angeles church because they were trying to establish a church in Seattle. So um, during the mission trips, just for reference, is when they try to get as many people baptized as, as they can within like a week or two. And so they, they, like, as much as they don't share information with members, like on a normal day um, before they're baptized, they share even less on, um, you know, during the mission trips. So, um, so the next day they gave me a call. They said, Hey, do you want to come to our church and study the Bible more? And I said, yeah, sure. And I said, but you know, I don't have a car and, um, I'm not really familiar with the, the bus system yet in Seattle. And they said, Oh, don't worry. We can give you a ride. So I said, okay. So they showed up and I just all common sense, any stranger danger thing I've been told before, just over my head gone because I got into a car with people I didn't know, coincidentally a white van, right? And um, they took me to a city I'd never heard of, uh, which was Linwood, uh, which is about, you know, 20, 20, 25 minutes north of Seattle. And um, and the the church was in a house. I'd never heard the, heard of the concept of a house church before. So um, so I went, I went to their church, um, not a lot of members there because again, you know, there was people for the, from the mission trip um, but once the mission trip had actually ended up leaving, it was only just like five or six members left behind. Um, and so, um, so yeah, so I got there, uh, we all ate dinner around, like it was so small that we could all fit around a dinner, like a dining room table and we all ate dinner together and everybody was super nice. Um, you know, I know now that's love bombing, but, um, you know, everybody was super nice. Um, you know, they're asking me questions about myself. I was answering them. Then we did a Bible study. We did um, this Bible study called the Prophecy of King David, which basically, you know, as, as Steve explained, it, 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 they through this study they explain why they think An Sang Hong is second coming Christ. And so they told me they actually did tell me the name An Sang Hong. They don't they don't tell a lot of members before they're baptized about the name An Sang Hong, especially during mission trips. But they had told me, and so I remember I wrote his name down in my Bible. Um, they wouldn't tell me how to spell his name. Um, they all know how to spell his name, but they wouldn't tell me how to spell his name. Um, and then they asked, do you want to get baptized? And I said, yeah, sure. Because even at that time, like I wasn't getting baptized necessarily because I believed wholeheartedly. I was just thinking more along the lines of, you know, this is another, this is kind of like a college experience kind of thing. And so I got baptized, um, in a bathtub in that church. Um, and then they started showing me after I got baptized, they, 
you know, we did the, the bread and wine, the Passover. They asked me for my information, like my name, my address, my phone number, all that. And then they uh, showed me a video about a bunch of members from their church going to Korea to visit a woman. Um, they didn't tell me who the woman was. They just said, she's Jerusalem. And so, or at least I don't remember them telling me who she was. I just remember them saying she's Jerusalem at that time. And so I just see a bunch of members, they're going to meet her, they're crying. And so, um, so I was like, that's kind of, that's kind of different. But um, then, I, you know, they took me home. And then a few days later was a Sabbath day. They keep the Sabbath day on Saturday. Um, they have three services. And I thought like other churches, I thought, oh, there's three services, but they're all the same. Just repeated, you know, among different times for people who couldn't join the other one. Um, but no, there are three different sermons. So I had actually asked them, I said, Hey, like, since there are three different sermons, can I stay in between the services? Um, uh, because, um, you know, I have a long way to go back by bus and not knowing that actually they were expecting me to stay between the services anyways. Um, so I did, I stayed, um, again, you know, everybody's super nice. It's like a family like atmosphere. I had no background in studying the Bible. Um, no knowledge of the Bible. Um, I had no family, no friends in the area. So I was very susceptible to, you know, being drawn in. Because again, even though the people are nice, again, that's how mind control works in the sense that even the people who are recruiting don't realize, you know, what they're doing to someone else too, um, because they're under the influence as well. So again, you know, I, I was having a good time, you know, being around people who are really nice, who wanted me there. Um, I wanted to be there. Um, then, you know, the mission, the mission trip left and it was me and the five or six other people. And it was even more like a family like atmosphere, um, because it's, it's less people there, you know, you have a very clear mission in mind. And I went from someone who, you know, didn't believe in the Bible or not, not, again, you know, didn't, not that I didn't believe in the Bible. It's just, I didn't care. I went from somebody not caring to somebody so gung-ho for this group that within three months I was preaching, I was recruiting. Um, and, you know, I, every Saturday I was there the whole day. Um, in 10 years, I can count on one hand how many services I missed. I was that dedicated. Um, and, and yeah, so uh, there, so I, I, I quickly, I mean, when you're in a small, when you're in a small group, they rely on the newer members more than you know, if you were to get baptized into a, a much larger branch, because we're they called us we're the pillars of we were the pillars of Seattle Zion. So it was like me and like two other people, or me and really one other person that, that I recall that they were focusing on um, uh, to to grow. And so um, so they put a lot of effort into us, and and yeah, and so within three months I was preaching, recruiting. Um, I was, I, I, I was so, so I, I believed everything the church told me. Um, and it was just, um, uh, yeah, I mean, and I continued that way for the entire time I was in the church. Um, and it didn't matter that I lived far away from the church either, because that was when the church was small. Um, and I had, um, I, I don't remember at what point I started talking about when I went to Korea. But, I, but the first time I went to Korea was when we were still in the house church. Um, it was in 2008 and I went to Korea, visited um, the, God, the, the, the woman they claim is God the mother. Her name is Jong Gil Ja. And um, you spend like five minutes with her. You have to wear a name tag the whole time because nobody there, including her, knows your name. Um, you, can't, you can't go out on your own. You have to, you have to be monitored the whole time. Um, and uh, yeah, you're taken, the first place we were taken was some random place in, in some random mountains in Korea. No idea where we were at. None of us have any phone. I mean, none of us, this was kind of before like smartphones. This is kind of when, you know, people still had flip phones. And if you go to another country, you're not getting service anyways. So, um, so yeah, so as an 18 year old, I went to Korea with three other members and, you know, just uh just studied the the bible the same subjects i learned in seattle studying them again um and spent maybe and 10 days spent maybe three hours or so max with john gilja and it's not one-on-one -on -one time it's like 100 people with her kind of thing and so so yeah um people when they go there when they see her they're very like emotional they cry i've seen some people like 
push themselves to cry. If they don't cry, they feel bad about not crying. Um, and, uh, and yeah, so, um, so when I came back, we were still in the house church and then around 2011, I believe, no, 2010, um, is when we, yeah, I think 2010 is when we moved into an office church and office church. It was a small office in Seattle. It was actually in a city called Shoreline and half the building was, um, uh, World Mission Society Church of God. The other half eventually became the the Church of Scientology. So it was like the battle of the cults, really. Um, you know, they were trying to recruit our people, and we were trying to protect our people. So it was a it was an interesting time. But um, but again, you know, it's in C- I would say in Seattle, I was much more gung ho because I, I when we moved to Shoreline, I actually lived very close to the church. Like I could walk from my house to the church, and I lived with church members too every single person in my house was a church member. And, um, and so actually it's, it's, I don't know if I shared this the first time, but uh, my major in, in school was actually uh, Korean. And because of this, because of this church, because uh, when I was, when I was going to the university, I was also simultaneously in the church of God. And so in my mind, um, I was thinking like, I need to pick a major that I can use for the gospel work. And so, obviously can't do religion because you know that's they you know they were telling me that that was studying falsehood right and so i had chosen korean because i was like okay i can use korean right especially in the church of god where you know their headquarters is in korea um and you know they're they're you know the woman they say is god is korean she can't speak english um a lot of the members from korea come to the u.s to preach and so um so yeah so being able to help out there so yeah, so I majored in Korean. And even before I even started my major in Korean, um, in, in the Church of God, they have groups. So they d- they divide everybody into groups. And we were so small that we were like, really, I mean, we weren't, we weren't uh, divided into the normal groups that the Church of God has. We were just divided into just random groups. So I got put with the Koreans. And I got put with the Koreans who, they weren't here because they wanted to preach the gospel. Like they were here because like one of them, her husband was in Korea. The other one, like she had already moved or, or sorry, her husband was in the Korean government. He was in the, the U.S. for his job. And then uh, another woman, um, she had already moved to Seattle before the church even got established there. So um, and that's actually the woman that I ended up living with um, her and her son when I was in Seattle. And so. Um, so, yeah. So, I mean, they taught me after every Sabbath day how to read and write Korean. Um, and, uh, which definitely, uh, I don't think they're going to be doing that for anybody else going, going forward because, uh, I could definitely understand stuff that they did not want me to understand eventually. So, um, and, uh, and how they would refer to other members too. Plus the Korean females were like gossip central in the church of God. Um, they knew everything about everyone and, uh, yeah. And so, um, so yeah, so I was in Seattle from 2007 till um, the middle of 2011 when I graduated. I missed my own graduation because of the church because it fell on a Saturday. I missed my sister's graduation uh, from high school because it fell on a Tuesday evening. Um, and when I was, you know, in Seattle, um, Portland's only about two and a half hours away from Seattle. And so, um, but at that time, there wasn't a church in Portland. So they told me that the only time, if I wanted to go visit my family, the only time I could go was between Wednesday and a Friday. So I, the max I could see my family for four years was two and a half days. Um, and there was one time that I had actually gone to, to Portland and my car broke down. And then at, by that time, there was a house church in Portland and they wouldn't let me keep the service at the house church. They said, I need to find a way to get back to Seattle to keep the Sabbath day. So, um, so yes, I, 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 you know, I, I spent a lot of money to get my car fixed to go back that same day. And, uh, yeah, just so I can keep the Sabbath day. Cause if you don't keep the Sabbath day, you don't get your attendance points. That means you're out of the running to be able to go visit God, the mother in Korea. You have to have perfect attendance to do that. And you have to be consistently tithing. And so, um, so yeah. Um, and then 2011, after I graduated, um, I moved back to Portland um or really vancouver washington the the how the church in portland was actually in a a city called beaverton and so it was house church still and uh 
I didn't at that time, like I didn't have a car, I didn't have a job. So um, I couldn't be going every single day um, like I had been doing in Seattle because of my circumstances, but I was still keeping every service. Um, I still, you know, try to go at least one time during the week to go for preaching. Um, but I was also preaching by myself in Vancouver. Uh, my sister attended a community college and I would go with her during her classes and I would go um, and preach while she was, you know, in her classes. She thought I was just sitting down studying, but um, I was actually going around preaching and, um, and studying with people. And so, um, so yeah, so I mean, from, from there, I was in Portland from 2000, mid 2011 till the end of 2017. And uh, really quickly, Portland grew from, I mean, when, when I had gotten there, within six months, we were already in an office building um, because office, or not, sorry, not office building, a bigger building. Um, we skipped the office church stage because uh, the building, the, the rent for the building was a better price than the rent for an office building. And so, um, so yeah, uh, yeah, I was there till the end. And uh, again, I was very active. Um, you know, I, I studied all the subjects. Um, I was, you know, co group lead because like the, the, the main groups in the church are the young adult groups. That's the age from like 18 to 30. So there's a male young adult group and a female young adult group. I was co leader of the female young adult group for a while. And then I was leader over the kids class for a while. And then I was group leader for the, the teenagers uh, for a while as well. And on top of that, I was because they have their classes for when they teach like people how to preach. They were called course classes at the time. I think they're probably called some. Well, when I had left, they were starting to call it Elohim Academy. Um, but I was course class, two, the level two teacher. Uh, when we got uh, the last overseer that I saw when I was there, when he had come, he uh, replaced all the female teachers. He says females were not fit to teach. And so that's when I, you know, stopped becoming the course class or course two leader uh, or teacher. Um, I was someone that they would, you know, that they would send to teach new members. Um, and frankly, you know, I was pretty good at teaching. Um, they say everybody has like a, you know, a gift from God. And they would tell me that my gift was as was teaching the subjects. Um, and uh, yeah, and so, um, so yeah, so I was, I, I did all of that. I was uh, also, as we mentioned, you know, for each of the studies, we had to get, you know, signatures and then a confirmation. I was one of the ones for a while that could give confirmation. Um, and, you know, I tested people to make sure that they, it, to, to pass them or, or not pass them on to the next course levels. I mean, so I know my stuff. I know the, the WMS COG doctrine in and out. Uh, I might not remember the exact verses right now, but I remember every single concept and um, every single tactic and every single countermeasure. Um, I was one of the people that they, they sent to, um, like if, like if one of the, the female members had looked online, um, like at the examining site, namely, I was one of the people that they sent to kind of dispel anything that the, any questions that the person had. Um, and uh, so, yeah, so it's kind of surreal being on the other side, you know, reading the examining site. Cause actually when I, when I left the church, uh, this is something I didn't mention in the first video or the last week was when I left the church, all it took was for me to be a week separated, like just a week long separation from the church for me to look at the examining site with fresh eyes and be able to internalize the information that was there. Because before when I was a member and I would look at the site, like my mind would and not only look at that site, but even like look at the, the video that Steven Hassan did with uh, Ron Ramos, you know, looking at that with fresh, like looking at that with the eyes of a member, um, you're, you're, you're just, your mind's just immediately guarded, right? And so like, even though the information is there, the, the facts are there, like I couldn't see it at the time. So just being separated from the group for a week allowed was was enough time for me to look at everything with fresh eyes and to truly internalize it so that you know i could um you know feel feel somewhat good about leaving the group because i i was one of the people that i didn't leave because of doctrine but because of burnout i mean i saw a lot of things that you know were red flags left and right i heard a lot of things um i mean i saw stuff that you know i i didn't understand why you know members who were you know doing like because they said every decision 
uh, made in the church came from God the Mother. So if somebody was like promoted um, to like a title holder, they became, you know, that was because God the Mother was behind it. If somebody became like a, like a unit leader or a group leader, it was because God the Mother appointed them. And I was seeing people get promoted, like, but they were like, I knew they were doing bad things. Like I saw one person, they, this person was cheating on their wife, right? And I knew that they were cheating on their wife, but yet this person, you know, is getting a lot of attention by the overseer and being groomed to become a, a group leader. You know, I saw some people, um, I saw, saw some people, a lot of stuff I, I can't really say. It's not my story to tell. Um, and it, it, it'll definitely raise the, the litigation ears of theirs litigation happy ears of theirs but um but you know i i saw a lot of stuff and um i didn't understand why an organization who they say every decision is coming from god the mother would allow these people to not only get promoted but even still come to the church why they were even allowed to set foot in the church i didn't understand and when i was a member I, you know, I always use the verse, John chapter 13, where Jesus says, you know, now you don't understand, but later you will. That was like a stop, uh, like I use, or not only I use that, but I was, you know, told that as a member, um, it, but it really became a thought stopping verse for me because even though I didn't understand what was going on, I didn't understand why certain people were still being allowed to come into the church. I thought now I don't understand, but later I will. And so, um, so once I once I, I left, and um, you know, it, it I, I, I left again because of burnout, not because of doctrine. Looked at the examining site, and then um, a year later, you know, made my own video to just you know share my experience. I was just going to do like my initial plan was just to do one and done, um, but then you know I saw some other videos coming out from former members, so I made. I made a couple of more, most of which I, I deleted and I only kept like maybe two or three. And then uh, Great Life Studios came out and uh, Great Life Studios came out on YouTube and they started doing videos on the church, explaining through the Bible. And it was really when I looked at, you know, that was really kind of like the, what, what kind of sealed the deal for me is seeing through the Bible why their doctrine was wrong. Because for me, and I can only speak for myself, you know, I because I know a lot of people who, who left the church and want nothing to do with the Bible, want nothing to do with God. But for me, again, only speaking for myself, is that the I, I, I've studied a lot of religions, you know, growing up more than, I mean, well, not now, but I studied a lot of different religions considerably and extensively, extensively. And it's what Christianity and the Bible that keeps bringing me back. Like something, something that I can't explain just keeps bringing me back to it. The, like I was, I was saying to, um, I was saying to somebody, you know, during the week that I said, you know, the the Bible, the the Bible and Christianity bring me the most peace, but it also has brought me the most trauma. <laughs> and so again, you know, I can't, I, I can't speak for others. Um, and but but a lot of people because again just to kind of tie this all together because i know we're, we're pretty we're pretty late on time but um you know for a lot of people leaving this church they they face a lot of uh trauma when leaving and they want nothing to do with the bible and i think you know an effective way to help people is is to because when is to give them time because uh how do i say like when because the Bible, I mean, for me, I had to put the, I put the Bible away for like a whole year because I couldn't even look at it. Anytime I tried to read the Bible, every, every single, like, every, well, not every single verse, but a good number of verses always brought me back to the WMS and I couldn't understand why I didn't believe it or why, why it was wrong. I just knew I didn't believe it. And so for, for people leaving, like they're really traumatized, um, not only from, you know, the church, but the church traumatizes them, you know, against you know, wanting to believe anything, really. And so an effective way to help these folks is giving them time and giving them space to understand for themselves, because this is, you know, one of the, the first times in a long time that they have the chance to be able to think for themselves. And so, um, you know, some people go towards the Bible, some people don't. And, um, but I think, you know, just sharing the message about the church 
is in and of itself, you know, really helpful and really healing from so i was in the seattle branch from about 2007 to 2011 and halfway around that time we had grown into a bigger church and they moved us into an office and we, ironically we shared an office it was a small office building we shared an office with the church of scientology and so um which is a you know another high demand group and so uh, so yeah, so you know, throughout the years, um, I just you know continue to build my relationship with these folks and dedicate every every single moment to the church. I mean, it got to the point where I was because I was also a student when I was in Seattle, and I I did graduate, but it was it was extremely hard to be so dedicated to the church and do my schoolwork well. So I barely I, I graduated, but I, I had a real tough time um you know getting you know studying and because in the back of my mind i was thinking you know this is just such a waste of time the world's going to end any moment um and at that time they were telling us that the world was going to end in 2012. Um, the closer it got to 2012 the less they talked about it but i distinctly remember being told at the end of 2009 that 2012 was going to be the last year and they even had us like physically prepping for it too they had us you know buying non-perishables we were buying army bags we were told that we need to have like a whole bunch of candles on hand we need to have a month's worth of food and water a lot of people buying chocolate because i guess chocolate lasts a while um and we always had to carry at least one of unsung Hong's books with us in case disaster happens we're stuck somewhere at least we have one book with us to keep a cert to keep service with um and so um so they were like physically prepping us for it and then of course you know 2012 came and when you know we're still here um and then suddenly they said like oh we never taught that um and so in 2000 but to backtrack just a little bit in 2011 i had actually graduated from school and then i moved to portland or right outside of portland in vancouver washington but the church was in the Portland area. And so um, so that was another house church. So I went from office back to house church. And it was it was probably, but it was a quite a few members. It was about 20 members or so in a small house. Um, and yeah, so we kept the Sabbath day there. Um, and that, I would say 2000, around that time is kind of when I, I would say the strength of my faith in the group started to kind of, go down a bit i was still doing church activities i was still very very active in the church but i would say that I, that's when my faith in the church started kind of going down a little bit um, because at that time i lived about 30 to 40 minutes driving distance away from the church so it wasn't as easy for me to go every single day and I, you know i didn't have a job didn't have a car and so um, it just it, it was it was difficult to go every single day but i would do that i would do the, a lot of the, like the preaching from vancouver and um just on my own and so um, like my sister would be going to school at, at her community college and i'd say hey can i go with you and i i told her i was just studying sitting at a table studying you know the bible but really i was going when she was in classes i was going around preaching and um so yeah, so I was doing the, the church activities from Vancouver and um, the church started to grow in Portland and we moved to a bigger building um, and the leadership in Portland wasn't as strong as the leadership that was in Seattle. The one, in, the, the leaders in Portland initially, they were, they were more laid back. I wouldn't say they were laid back in the, you know, average sense of laid back, but they weren't as, you know, how do I say, they weren't as strict. I guess you could say like if somebody said if somebody was like there's no way for me to keep service um then they would say okay you can keep it at home which any other leader would be like absolutely not you're not coming to service you're not getting your attendance point you know mother's gonna know in korea that's i mean it, it absolutely not so they were like a little bit less strict and um but again, same complete, you know, doct same doctrine as, as Seattle, um, same studies we had to learn, same activities on the Sabbath day, everything, you know, was, was still the same. And 
But again, over the years from 2011 to all the way until 2017 when I left, I would say year by year my faith kind of was, you know, kind of spiraling, um, spiraling at that point until in 2017 where I was just, I was so burned out. Uh, because if you're not preaching, um, they say that you can't be the 144,000. So this church is, so this church believes that it, not just 144,000 will go to heaven. They believe there's 144,000 and a great multitude. And so they teach like 144,000 is like the best of the best, right? Those are the people that they're not going to face physical death. They're going to go to heaven alive. And so, um, so they said, if you're not preaching, you're not going to be part of the 144,000. So basically you're going to die if you don't preach. And um, so that was always like in the back of my mind. But at the same time, like I was, you know, I was getting more involved with my, my actual work. So I was having more meetings. I was um, uh, living far away from the church. You know, I didn't have a very high paying job and my, par my car was not reliable. So, um, you know, going to the church every single day when you live like 30, 35 minutes away, it was, it was not very practical. And on top of that, giving other members rides who also lived in Vancouver who didn't have a way to get to the church. And so, um, so I became more and more burned out and more and more burdened by this group. They required so much of my, not only time, but also money. Um, at, so at one point I was giving up to like 40% of my income to this group. And again, I was, I was making not a lot, not a lot. And so, um, money was going to not just like tithes and offerings because you do have to give tithes um you know whenever you get paid but they expect you to give offerings for every single sabbath day service and then every single feast and the feast you're supposed to actually give more money and so um i was also paying for food for construction for seminars for kids activities for picture frames um for you even went to korea yes oh I, yeah I completely forgot about that i've gone to korea twice um, because they believe a woman named John Gil Ja is God the mother, and she's still living in Korea, um, to my knowledge. And um, yeah, so they have like pilgrimages to Korea. Um, after after 2012, the, the those trips kind of, the number of trips went down quite considerably. They had maybe once a year, and it was like by invite, whereas before you could just sign up. So um, yeah, I went to Korea in 2008 um, when I was 18 years old and basically you go there you meet her you spend very little time with her there's like you have maybe like a minute of one-on-one -on -one time with her the entire trip you're there for about 10 10 to 10 days to 14 days and um and you just you just study the same subjects you've already studied and you you practice preaching so again those preaching simulations and they have you watching videos um they have been watching like church related videos about the supposed history of An Sang Hong and, and John Gil Ja and um with your yeah. name tag before the all knowing goddess oh yeah you have to wear a name tag <laughs> she's not, you don't really need to wear a name tag but you have to wear a name tag and your name is um, written in Korean letters so she can read it and so um, and it says where you're from too and so um, so yeah um, you think she'd know huh <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Actually, because they, they, well, the thing is, is they say that every single day she wakes up early in the morning to to pray for everybody. She she prays like everybody's name out loud. But the thing is, is when you meet her in person, she doesn't know your name. You have to wear a name <laughs> tag. And so, um, but yeah, so I went in two thousand eight. Um, they show you, you know, videos about um, her and An Sang Hong's like alleged history, and basically a lot of videos to make you feel guilty, like that they are God, that they came down to this earth for, you know, to seek and save us because we are sinners. We try to kill them in heaven. Um, that's why we were sent here. And, you know, our punishment was death, but they came here in the flesh to teach us the truth again so that we can go back to heaven alive and uh, alive with them. Um, and um, they suffered yeah. for us. Yeah, they the suffered book bag. for us. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so they suffered for us. An Sung Hong carried, you know, hunt, like, you know, 50 pounds worth of books in his book bag you know he was wearing winter winter suits in the summer summer suits in the winter he only owned two suits 
Um, they said he was so poor he had to eat porridge, he had to eat hardtack crackers, he had to, you know, he had to drink stream water. They really Break rocks. <laughs> yeah, that, that he was a quarry man. That he, you know, broke rocks for thirty-seven years. Um, you know, there's no no proof for any of this, and there's actually picture evidence to dispute a lot of this. Um, but they they pump that through so that members they're watching it and they're thinking, oh my god, like they went through all of that because of me, and so it really you know increases your your guilt um, and makes you more dedicated to the church. So when you, when I went to Korea, it was a lot of that. Um, that was in 2008 and then 2009 I went the next year and that was kind of a different trip that was only for university students so actually that one I went alone and um, when they when they when they send you there actually they don't give you any contact information because I mean if, if you guys have ever flown internationally you know that before you get off the plane in that country they give you the customs form to fill out and you got to kind of you got to list where you're gonna be when you're in that country and they, don't, they didn't give you, they didn't give me any address, didn't give me a phone number for anybody to talk to. Um, they just said, just go, you'll figure, you'll figure it out. And so 19 year old me going to Korea by myself. And this was a time when, you know, I think North Korea had just bombed a South Korean ship, you know, just going, going to Korea, going to South Korea. So I went and um, that trip was considerably different because Again, it was only for university students, and what they did was they they brought us to many different universities in South Korea, and and they told us that we couldn't tell anyone that we were from the World Mission Society Church of God. They said, "Don't say God bless you. Don't say because they always call each other brother sister. Don't say brother sister. Don't say um, deacon deaconess pastor. Don't say any of those things." If anybody asks, you're from Dejion, which is like their environmental volunteer group. And so um, so they basically used us for PR a lot of that trip. And um, yeah, it took us from university to university. And then later I see on the Dejion side, I see like, you know, these, these posts, or not posts, but like pictures, you know, saying like, oh, these are university students from all over the world who, who are part of this wonderful... Um, you know, volunteer group for the environment. And it's like, no, we came to meet, you know, John Gilja, God the mother. <laughs> you just told us to go here. They even covered up the buses that they hauled us around because there were about 100 people. The buses that they hauled us around on, um, they actually, like, covered up the, um, the, like, the, the church name. And so, again, you know, they didn't want people to know we were from the Church of God because they said if people knew we were from the World Mission Society Church of God, they would not accept our our um, volunteer work. And so they had people from the community there. And so it was just a big PR, a big PR thing. Um, because, you know, eventually people will put together that, you know, this, this organization's with the Church of God. Eventually that information gets out. Because it's, it's not the only volunteer group that they set up. So that was primarily the, the reason for that second trip. Um, but, you know, again, you know, on that trip too, like, we we the time we spend with Jung Gilja is like very very minimal, and you don't really have one on one time unless you're some kind of special member. You really don't have that one on one time. Um, but it's besides that, it was a lot of studying, and um, they also have in Korea. They have a head. Their headquarters is in Korea. I forget the actual city. I think it's Seoul, but um, they have a big like office building like a like a like a tower it's got like you know 14 15 maybe more levels of it and it's all it's the, it's the church of god headquarters and on the one of the floors they have a whole floor dedicated to what they call the church of god museum and this place is elaborate i mean it is fancy they have like the whole history from the time of adam and eve all the way up until the time of unsung hong and john gilja and their gospel work in our age um and so yeah so they, they even show you they even have um like a simulation of like the rocks um uh that unsung Hong had to carry on his back or that he allegedly had to carry on his back um because they they'll show you like a video of, of an actor playing him and his like back is all bloody and from carrying, you know, I, I don't know how much those rocks weigh, but I mean, so the, the purpose was so members would try it out and realize, oh, wow, you know, An Sang Hong, he went through all of that because of my sin, because I tried to kill him and got er, him in, you know, the kingdom of heaven. 
and so um so yeah again like the whole trips they're all about like basically guilting you and and making you see like okay this is what Ansan Hong and John Gilja went through you know that's why you need to work hard to preach the gospel when you go back to your country so that you know we can end they always say so we can end mother's suffering quicker um, which means so that she can go so we can all go back to the kingdom of heaven because as a member you like really like they really they really say like you know like this is like every year they say this is a year we can go to the, back to the kingdom of heaven and they say oh i can't wait to go to heaven but no, see, act- let me let me just clarify for listeners so the kingdom of heaven is kind of a pre-existent world not unlike the mormons they say we all live before we came to earth instead of yeah. calling the pre-existence like mormons they call it the kingdom of heaven and that's where you know they allege that we tried to kill father and mother in that pre-existent state and we're sent here to this this prison which is earth you know um you know it's it's kind of a bad thing according to them in a sense but go ahead yes yes that we existed in, you know before in the kingdom of heaven you know our souls existed there but you know we were tempted by satan we um unintentionally committed sin against god we unintentionally tried to kill god in heaven and that's why we were sent down on this earth to repent of our sin <clears throat> You know, An Sung Hong and John Gilja, they came down to this earth so that they could personally teach us how to keep God's law and, you know, to, well, in in our time to, um, you know, again, explain what God's law is. Because even though Jesus brought it 2,000 years ago, it was abolished, they teach, um, like Passover, Sabbath day. And so the An Sung Hong and John Gilja had to come down to this earth to, An Sung Hong, to remind us of those laws. And to, t- and to set up the example that we need to keep them and John Gilja to continuously set the example that we need to keep them and if we do all of that we you know we can go to the kingdom of heaven so and you will be a mother in the last days uh, yeah yeah that's that yeah and actually the funny thing is with um with John Gilja actually I didn't know her name until about three years after I had already joined the church because they don't because i remember when i had for the first day that i had went to the church i they showed me the video of so many members going to korea and meeting her and i asked what's her name and they said jerusalem mother that's her name and i said no what's her real name they said jerusalem mother and then you know a couple years later the church has like some magazine about the we love you foundation which is another one of their volunteer groups um volunteer shell groups and it had her picture and then it said her name underneath it said john gilja and i asked the deaconess i said i kind of i was like almost ashamed to like see like oh shoot did i see something i wasn't supposed to see um because i asked the deaconess on the side i said is this is this her name and she's like yeah but we don't use it and so which i thought was weird because they have so much emphasis on how important unsung home's name is that we have to know his name for our salvation but then they don't want to say her name even though she is god they teach she's god the mother and so um so yeah i didn't know her name until like three years into the church and you know whenever people would come to the church and they would see pictures of her they would ask who's that <coughs> woman that everybody surrounded around and they was and everybody would say oh well we'll study about her later or they would say oh that's jerusalem um but, but they've kind of lightened up on that now because she's got her own website like zonkilgrath.com so <laughs> yeah <laughs> they've kind of lightened up the chairwoman <laughs> Yeah. The W Foundation. Yeah, she is. Yeah, she is the chairwoman for the organization, but she's also the the leader of the World Mission Society Church of God. Yeah. But yet, the church says there's no connection between the two. So I don't. I don't know. But um, and just just to add, so they have the general pastor Jucho Kim. They kind of lead the church together. So Ansung Hong died in 1985. Mother's still alive. She's older now. And general pastor, you know, he's like 61, and he's uh, running the church right now with yeah. mother yeah yeah Korean, so, yeah yeah it's, it's again you know the headquarters everything you know it, it's it's all in korea and then it's trickled down to all these other countries um so like in the u.s we have like a couple of prominent korean pastors who are you know in charge of the the, the bigger churches in the u.s and then they also oversee the smaller churches within um the nearby regions so uh, but all of them every year they're going back to korea for a general assembly meeting and they are um you know being told like okay this is what we're going to continue to say for certain things we're not going to say this anymore we're going to say this now um there's a lot of gaslighting in this church because as i mentioned with 2012 right the closer they got to 2012 the less they talked about it and then once 2012 hits 
um, that's when they went back and said, oh, we never said 2012 was the last year. And um, it's funny because I was there, I heard them say 2012 was the last year, but once they said, oh, the 2012 was not the last year, we never said that, we said that's the year when the new Jerusalem will be complete. And even though I knew that wasn't true, um, something in my mind was like, okay, just accepted it. And so when people later on, years later, when people would say, like, when people would look up the church online and see, oh, the church said the world would end in 2012. Um, and then I would say, oh, no, the church never taught that. They taught something else, but it was misconstrued. Even though I, you know, again, I, had, I knew what they said. I was there. But I, you know, just repeated the rhetoric that, oh, they never said that. So it's, it's and I didn't, and I didn't feel bad about that either. And I didn't feel strange, like, oh, you know, why is the church lying? It's okay. Because, like, if, if you didn't understand anything in the church, they would always, like, show that verse in John chapter 13, where Jesus says, like, um, now you don't understand what I'm doing, but later you will understand. So that was, like, kind of like this, like, kind of like thought stopping or thought killing, like, um, um, or that was used for thought stopping or thought killing um, because you're just like, okay, I don't understand, going to the back of my mind, going to forget about it. And um, that got me through a lot of years in the church because there was a lot of things I saw that, that were not morally correct. Um, and it would just, but, it, but it's not that it would be allowed in the church, it's just that it would get swept under the rug in the church. And, um, and yet the people, you know, doing those things, they would, you know, move up within the church. They would either become like a teacher or they'd get like a, like a title and I, or people with titles doing things that were, you know, not morally correct and still keeping their titles. And so I never understood that because I see so many people, I saw so many people working so hard and not moving, moving up in the church wasn't like the, the goal. But, you know, I saw so many people working so hard, dedicating all of their time to the church, living in, like, poverty for the church, and yet the church didn't care about them at all. And so, um, but yet the, this guy who, you know, the, this guy who just cheated on his wife, oh, he's a teacher now. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, um, I, you know, again, you know, that verse from John chapter 13 just always popped into my head you know, now you don't understand, but later you will. And it got to the point where I was like, I was, you know, they, because again, they require you to be at the church every single day. And even, even on holidays where it's like Christmas or, or um, Easter, or, you know, days where the rest of the world gets the day off, you know, we were still, I still had to go to the church, couldn't, couldn't hang out with my family, had to go to the church and maybe we'd have a barbecue or watch some movie together or something. They, I was at the church like, yeah, there was no days off within a year. In 10 years, even when you're sick, even when you're sick, you still have to go to the church. Um, like, especially on like a Sabbath day or a feast, there was, or there was like one day, because they celebrate a feast called Feast of Unleavened Bread. They keep it the day after Passover. And on that day, we have to fast. And fasting in the Church of God means no food and no water. So no food, no water, no medicine, nothing, okay? And so that day we were fasting and we have service at 5 a.m., 9 a.m., and 3 p.m. And I suddenly, just completely randomly got the stomach flu that morning after that 5 a.m. service. Because we were going to, to, to Winco to go buy some food for the church for later when we could eat. And, um, and suddenly I was like, oh, this is, something, something's not right. And so I was very clearly sick. And you know, you know when you get the stomach flu, that you got the stomach flu and I couldn't take any medicine. <laughs> I couldn't take any medicine, couldn't drink any water and I still had to keep the services because they say like, oh, it's Satan trying to keep you from, you know, receiving blessings. So, but the thing is, is like stomach flu is highly contagious, right? So one person gets it, the entire church has pretty much gotten it. And so after that, you know, a ton of people got sick, but again, we're still required to go and keep the services, even if, I mean, you can have like, you know, 102 degree fever, you still need to be there to keep the services. You know, you just need to keep quiet about that. Uh, well, the example, example we always give is like, you know, if you have a, 
a mother's funeral on a Sabbath or, or your, you know, daughter's graduating or anything like that. They, you know, they say, you can't go. You, what if father comes back? Let the dead bury the dead. You know, don't yeah. go to the funeral. It's absolute incredible pressure in that. Well, actually, I got kind of like a related story to that. And I don't think I've ever even said this on the Great Life Studios, you know, show, too. But um, because my my both my parents passed away when I was in the church. And so um, my dad had had a stroke and he was in the hospital for a couple of days. And I was still going to the church, still doing the church activities. Um, But, you know, it got to a certain point where they're like, okay, you need to consider, you know, pulling the plug kind of thing. And so, um, so, but the day, the day that the doctor said we, we should do that coincided with the um, Ascension Day in the church. And we had to be at the church at, um, like, I think it was 9 a.m., 3 p.m., and 8 p.m. That's one of the, well, excuse me, one of the seven feasts and three times they keep in the church, Ascension Day. Um, yes, yes, it's, it's, it's part of, you know, part of that cluster. Just for those things, yeah. Yeah, and so they keep all the, they keep the feasts in Leviticus 23. Um, but they they don't keep it according to the the way you know Old Testament says they keep it um, according to the their version of how the New Testament says they say. Um, but yeah, so um, I remember like the night before I called the the overseer and that overseer was like the less strict one. So I said, hey, this is what's going on. Like keep in mind, my dad's dying in the hospital, and my mind is on what do I need to tell the church? How am I going to keep the feast? That's where my mind was. And so, um, so yeah, I called him and I said, hey, this is what's going on. Like, you know, this is the time that we're trying to like, you know, they're, they're probably gonna, you know, you know, unplug the machines. And they, they were like, oh, do you think you can kind of schedule that between, <laughs> between you know, the, the second service, the evening service. And then, you know, they said, okay, you, you know, as long as you come for the morning service, you kept the feast. So I literally, drove all the way out to, I, you know, drove 45 minutes out um, to some random, I forgot the name of the park, to some random, because we keep the Ascension Day Park, or Ascension Day Feast in a park, um, because they say we can't have like a, you know, ceiling. Um, so, uh, so I went all the way out there to keep the feast, drove back to the hospital, and then um, at in that day I was just, you know, I was just like, you know what, I don't care what the church is going to say about me, I'm not, I, oh, I did, I think, did I keep the, I can't remember if I kept the afternoon service or not, but I was like, for the evening service, I was like, you know what, I don't care what the church says about me, I'm not going to keep the evening one, my dad just died, a, you know, an hour ago, you know, I'm not really feeling up to go into church and, you know, keeping a 30 minute service, and so after that, I missed that evening service, and after that, I had everybody calling me, saying, where were you, you know, did something happen with your car? Because you know you can't tell the you can't tell the church members your problems because they say it, it detracts the attention away from father and mother, um, and especially on a feast day. So they say you can't tell the other other members your problems. So um, nobody knew. I didn't I didn't tell anybody. But I mean, literally, my dad's dying, and my thought is, how am I going to keep the service? Um, and then, yeah, and so, so yeah. I mean, you, you miss. If anything coincides with the church activity, you're expected to miss it. Otherwise, you're not gonna you're not gonna get your attendance point for it. And if you don't get your attendance point for it, Korea is gonna find out, and then they're not gonna allow you to go see God the Mother in Korea because you have to have perfect attendance to be able to do that. And um, so yeah, so I mean, I miss my sister. I I missed most of my sister's wedding. Um, I missed my own college graduation because it fell on a Saturday. Um, and again, it's just like one Saturday. I didn't even ask for the whole Saturday off. I just asked, hey, it's like this one, for my sister's wedding, I was like, hey, it's at, you know, 2 p.m. Service, your service is at 2.30. I was like, can I, can I keep just this, just this one service at my house, you know, so that I can go to my sister's, like, full wedding? And they said no. So, um yeah they don't they don't allow exceptions for it. there was another time where it snowed because portland um i don't know about other areas but portland cannot handle snow i mean two to two inches and the city shut down and not i mean not in a good way and so it snowed one time and i remember leaving my house at like we were still expected to go to the church and i left my house at like 6 a.m to, to give myself three hours to get there a three-hour window to get there 
and I got there and there was a lot of people who lived even closer to the church who did not show up and I remember being told like those are the people that don't have strong faith so um so yeah I mean I, over the years I just got tired of that kind of behavior um and I was doing like church activities like I said you know I live far away I was doing church activities from the city that I lived in I just wasn't reporting it into the church because I was like I was mentally checked out from the church but I still was afraid not to do the church activities sometimes I called other members in the area and we you know would go preaching in the mall together but sometimes I would just do it by myself because I didn't want to you know interact with other people from the church and so um but again you know I didn't it's not that I didn't believe in the doctrine it was just I was so burned out from the the politics of the church and um so the, the overseer, because again, I wasn't reporting in that I was going preaching, because they take attendance for preaching. I, I wasn't reporting that I was doing that, even though I was. And the overseer's wife would uh, tell me that I was, you know, being lazy, that I'm losing blessings um, from not doing these things. And it got to a point where, like, that overseer um, left. or they, the, That overseer, something happened with that overseer. I think they got in trouble and they were sent back to California and they sent someone they were going to send someone new and so i took that opportunity because i really didn't like that overseer i took that opportunity to be like you know what i'm done and i just didn't show up to the church one day and um and that's really what like well actually one other thing before that what led me to leave because right before that because that was like maybe two sabbath days after the autumn feast and the autumn feasts are you know part of what steve mentioned you know the seven feasts and three times it's the you know, Day of Trumpets, Feast of Atonement, and Day of Tabernacles, and then last and greatest day of Feast of Tabernacles. And um, it's basically like a month long, you know, a, a month long run of where we're at the church every day, 4.30 a.m. and 7, 7 p.m. And then, you know, if it, it on the Sabbath day, we're there from 4.30 a.m. until like 9 p.m., okay? Very, very long days. And I was, again, because I was so burned out, I was starting to have like panic attacks. Um, and uh, on that last day of the Feast of Tabernacles, like after I, I went home after the, the 4.30 a.m. service and I felt like, I felt like I was gonna like pass out, but not pass out. And so I, I called the doctor, made a same day appointment uh, but the appointment was very, very close to the next service. And I remember texting the deaconess and I said, it was the overseer's wife, and I said, hey, like, I really need to go to the doctor um, because I was like, I feel like I'm going to pass out. You know, I can't, I should, probably shouldn't even be driving a car because, again, I would have to drive 35 minutes to get there. And she said, um, she said, you know, this is Satan trying to, you know, keep you from getting blessings. This is the last and greatest day of the feast. Like, you should be here for this. So what I had done was I went to the doctor. Uh, that appointment ended. And then I went back to the church for the service. And then I drove back to the doctor to get lab work done. And by the time I did that, I was like, you know what? This is ridiculous. This is like, I shouldn't have to, I shouldn't have to ask a church if I can go to the doctor, right? If I can miss a service to go to the doctor. That shouldn't even be in my mind to even let them know. <laughs> and so, um, so when I got word, like, you know, a few days later that the overseer was being sent back to California, I was like, you know what, I don't want to, I don't want to see, I didn't mind the overseer's wife, but I didn't like the overseer. And I was like, you know what, I don't want to see all these people sad for somebody that I'm happy for them to leave. So he left, I left, and I just didn't show up, and I didn't answer anybody's texts or calls. And, um, and then, like, a few days, the next Monday, they actually showed up at my work to get a hold of me. And so, um, so yeah, I left because, so that's what kind of sparked it. I left because I was getting panic attacks and I was um, just burned out from their their time commitments. And, but when I, when I left, like I thought, like I still believe that I was gonna go to hell because they teach that if you ever leave the church of God, your life will be worse than if you never joined at all. Because they use, they use the example, I think it's in Second Peter, where it says it's like a dog returning to his vomit. And so um, they say, if you leave the church to God, you know, something bad is going to happen. You're going to get into an accident. You're going to die prematurely. You're going to get cancer, something like that. 
And so I fully believed that when I left, I was like, okay, I'm going to go to hell. But in my head, I was like, you know, if the kingdom of heaven is like the World Mission Society Church of God, I don't want to go there because it's awful there. And um, so, so yeah, so when I left, I fully believed I was going to go to hell. They showed up at my work the following Monday and um, basically I were like, how come you didn't keep the service? This is just, this is just one Saturday I missed. And they were showing up at my work to come find me. And so, because they didn't actually, because I had just moved at that time, they didn't actually know where I lived. And so, um, so yeah. So uh, they showed up at my work. They're like, where, where were you? And I said, you know, to be honest, like, you know, I just want a break. I'm so burned out. And they said, oh, just try to keep at least one service. Because that's how they get you to come back. <laughs> that They say, oh, just as long as you're in there, they'll, get, they'll suck you back in. I said no I just need a break and so so yeah so then um, we, we left and then after she left I was like okay I need some kind of reason to to validate me leaving I was like I can't just not go because I'm tired or because I'm burned out I didn't, in my head I didn't think that was a like a logical reason to leave or a good enough reason to leave and so what I did was I went, there's this, there's this really good site called examining the WMSCOG.com. And um, this is a site, you know, created, it was created back in, you know, 2011. And it has so much good information about the group because this group is, you know, Korean based, right? So a lot of the information about the church is, you know, the, the, like the, 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 the dirt on the church is like available in Korean. So, you know, there's people who, you know, from 2011 that work to, you know, get some of this information available in English. I mean, they had, like, they had, like, public documents. They had, like, tax forms or tax-exempt, you know, like, you know, when a church applies for tax-exempt status, like, those forms. And that was really what, like, that was, like, the nail in the coffin for me when I read the Los Angeles one. Because in the Los Angeles one, they said that the church was started in 1998 by founding father Kim Joo Chol. Um, because he had a vision from God. And first, everything about that is wrong. E every single point in that statement is wrong. The church was not started in 1998. They teach that the church was started in 1964, was not started by Kim Joo Chol, who was the general pastor that Steve mentioned. It was actually started by a man named An Sang Hong, who they say is God, right? And Kim Joo Chol never had a vision from God. Right? They actually they actually criticize the Mormons because they say, oh, how can people believe Joseph Smith? He had a vision. Right? You can't validate a vision. But then they write that same thing on, you know, a form that they're submitting to the government. And so I was just like, oh, my gosh. And so I, just, I, I literally spent all that time reading the examining site and just writing out a whole bunch of questions. And um, I was, when I was in the church, you know, I was, I was a leader when I was in the church. I was, a, I was a group leader for the young adult members, so like the 18 to 30 year olds. Uh, I was a co-group leader for that. I was a leader for the, the kids class for a couple of years. Um, I was leader of the teenagers uh, for a while. And so, you know, when people would look online, um, sometimes they would send me to go talk to those people. And, you know, dispel all the stuff that, you know, people say online about the church. So I knew, ex and, and on top of that, I was also in, you know, their discipleship program, which is where they, you know, talk about the countermeasures that general Christians have against the World Mission Society doctrine. So I knew every single thing the church was going to say about all the things that I found, or I could predict what they were going to say. So what I did was I predict, or I wrote down one question further. That I knew they weren't questions further that I knew they weren't going to be able to answer, and so um, that that member who showed up at my work, because uh, until that point, from the time they showed up at my work until you know until like um, that day that I that I looked up everything on the examining site, people were still contacting me from the church, saying you know where are you? I hope you're doing well. We miss you. We love you, and so um, so I texted the the person who showed up at my work and I said hey. Like, I looked online, and I have a lot of questions. From that moment, every call, every text message from every other person stopped. Nobody contacted me anymore. People blocked me from Facebook, okay? So, um, so she's, like, well, she's like, well, we can meet. I can answer any question you have. 
And so, um, so I was like, okay. So we met at the mall, brought all my questions. She couldn't answer a single one of them. One of them being like, you know, where's, because they, 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 they put so much emphasis that An Sang Hoon was baptized in 1948 because they say, you know, David was 30 years old when he became king. He reigned for 40 years. An Sang, Jesus, you know, he, he was 30 years old when he was baptized. So An Sang Hoon has to be 30 years old when he's baptized. And so in 1948, he would have been 30. And Trying to make so, it fit the prophecy. This yes, is a, a yes, Rudy David so prophecy they do. Yeah. yeah. And so, so they put so much emphasis because they, they they basically say like this is why he is second coming Christ is because he was baptized mm -hmm. age thirty in 1948, which is when Israel gained its independence and Korea gained its independence. And um, so I so so my question to them was, where is the proof that he was baptized in 1948? Where's the record? What church was he baptized in? Who baptized him? And they said, oh, like all the records were destroyed in a fire. And I said, okay, what, like, when did that fire occur? Again, where was he baptized? Where, because, like, then I would be able to look it up, right? And she couldn't give me any details. And so, um, so I said, well, how can you expect me to dedicate my entire life to this group when there's no substantial evidence in any of these, you know, historical claims about An Sung Hong's life? And, um, and then at the end of it, she was basically like, I mean, because I mean, we did this for a couple of hours, and so at the end of it, she was basically like, you know, do you really believe what these people online are saying? Like, you're just gonna believe anything you find on the internet? And I said, I'm not saying I believe them, but I'm just saying there's lack of proof on your guys' side. You say he was baptized in 1948, therefore the burden of proof is on you. Um, you can't get mad when people ask, where's the proof when you're making this claim? And so, um, so yeah, so at the end of it, she told me like, you know, you need to apologize to father and mother, like you're gonna go to hell. And this is somebody that I was close with when I was in the church, you know? And so, um, so from that time, like, you know, I, again, I mean, that's, that really helped was that examining side going through. Um, but at the end of the day, so, so that helped, but at the end of the day, I still didn't understand why the doctrine was wrong. I didn't, I didn't necessarily believe the doctrine, but I did not believe it. And so in my head, I was thinking, you know, if I don't know why the doctrine's wrong, you know, I might end up going back. And so around that time, luckily, you know, Great Life Studios channel came out on YouTube. And I guess, you know, the, the guys from there, Jordan Hatfield and, and his brother and his brother-in-law, they had been approached by somebody from this group and they, you know, they started doing videos, you know, showing how through the Bible, the verses that the World Mission Society Church of God were, were showing how they're not, like, their explanations are not biblically correct when you look twisted. at the context. Yeah, they're twisted, um, you know, and so I, like, and, and they weren't, like, short videos. They were, like, you know, an hour or so long, and I, like, literally sat there going going through my Bible, I was very well versed in all the, you know, all the Royal Mission Society doctrine. I passed every test they gave me. I was, you know, finished all the course classes. I was in the discipleship program. You know, I, I, I mean, there was, I, I, I knew how to preach the feast. I knew how to, I mean, I knew all the studies a normal member should know, even some that, you know, title holders knew. I knew how to preach them. And so, um, so, you know, when Great Life Studios is going through their doctrine, or going through the the doctrines about God the Mother and proving how through the Bible this doctrine is not sound, you know, it really, it really like kind of set something off in my mind. I was like, wait a minute, like this, they, they're making some really good points. Because in the past I had heard some people say things, because again, I studied, you know, the countermeasures the church gave me. So they they're apologetic, excuse me, they're apologetics to answer Christians, basically. Yeah. It's their response to us. So when we try to go against them, they have a book. I'll just, um, I don't know if I'm in camera right now, uh, Jason, but it's called The Staff of Moses, and this is the countermeasures, one of the main books they use to respond to Christians. Sorry, Kelsey, continue. Yeah, yeah, no, no, thank you, because in my, in my mind, it's, it's like, I, you know, I don't know the, the terminology for, for, um, for everyone else, I kind of just, you know, still have the, the WMS terminology in my mind, <laughs> but, but yeah, that's essentially what the countermeasures are, is they, you know, we'll, we'll like, like for example, Revelation twenty two seventeen says, "The Spirit and the Bride give the water of life." 
the World Mission Society Church of God says the bride is the is God the mother and the countermeasure is people say it represents the church so we have to be able to prove through the Bible why it doesn't represent the church and so um, so Great Life Studios like I, I had heard other people again I had heard other people make you know explanations about how you know the bride is the church um, but what was unique about Great Life Studios is that they took the verse in the context it was written and they explained through the context it was written why it couldn't be and so i was like okay this is like this they're making some really good points and so i contacted them through facebook and i was like hey like i you know i really enjoyed your video i'm a former member i have you know a bunch of other questions for you that i was hoping that you could help me understand through the bible and so one of which was passover because i didn't understand because like in the church of god they teach that passover is the way to eternal life like passover is the number one day in the church like if you miss passover you're dead to them basically like passover is the only way to eternal life it's like your passport to the kingdom of heaven um yeah it's yeah so if you don't keep passover 100 percent, you're going to go to hell is what they teach and so um i didn't it was very hard for me to understand how passover was not necessary in churches and they teach they teach passover is not communion because communion is like um you know people a memorial say, feast yes no, i do the bag it is a memorial that's what normal communion is i'm mean, saying so their communion yeah. yeah we look at it as a memorial feast to christ's work yeah and they look at communion as like just eating bread and wine on every sunday or first sunday of every month they say like for passover the date's important passover has an appointed date the 14th day of the first month and if and if you're not keeping it on that specific date then you know it's not passover it's like you know they use the example of like your birthday right my birthday is let's say my birthday is like september 1st right then if i um i can celebrate my birthday august 1st if i wanted to but only on september 1st i'll become a year older in the same way they say you know passover you can eat bread and wine any day of the week even the apostles they ate bread and wine you know other days but only on the passover is that actually passover bread and wine that gives us eternal life and so it was very hard for me to understand how passover was not necessary for salvation in in general churches and um so i remember you know i sent them a bunch of questions related to that and they provided me with verses and explanations and you know they were they were you know really good explanations but i didn't fully understand it because i think it was like you know it was through texting right so it's it's conversation is better for me to fully comprehend and then um that kind of tapered off and then i saw they did an interview with a former member named jeremy and um he was explaining about you know his experience in the church and that really motivated me to make my own video about you know what i went through in the church and um i made i made my own and then great life studios um i think they didn't realize that i was the same person that messaged them before um but um they reached out to me on my youtube channel and um was like would you do an interview with us and so initially i said no because i was i was very scared to speak out because again as i mentioned in the beginning this church is very litigation happy like it doesn't like to them it like well uh, in the u.s in general right you don't need a reason to sue someone you can sue them um i mean they can they can counter sue and say you you, you created a false lawsuit against me but you don't need a legitimate reason to sue someone and you know some people use it for intimidation right so like if so my worry was if i make a video they can sue me just to scare me to take it down and so um and so i was very very nervous but i at the end of the day i was just like you know what i'm just gonna do it i'm just gonna do it not think twice just do it and i posted it and you know it, it got a couple you know it got a good number of views and um great life studios reached out to me asked me to do an interview um initially i actually declined because I, you know, I was still scared that their church was going to come after me, and um, and then I eventually said yes, and it kind of just like from that it was it was it was really interesting because from that first like video I did with them, it was because before that they had asked me, 
if we could break down any doctrines of the church of God um, that would like, you know, like the critical doctrines, like what would help people the most? And I say, okay, that King David prophecy, um, I said Passover, and and they, they also teach Passover as a seal of God, that Passover will protect you from all disasters, just as in the time of Egypt, you know, like those who get the Passover plague passed over them. In the same way, in the last days in our time, those who keep the Passover, disasters um, and diseases and everything will pass over you. And so I said, okay, those three ones, those are the main ones. If we can break these down, then, you know, they really have no foot to stand on. And what it turned, that was a plan. But what it turned into was, because um, again, I was so heavily doc, doc, indoctrinated with their, with their teachings that, you know, I, I gave the, the points ahead of time to to Jordan and his, his brother-in-law from Great Light, and they did their research and they provided the counterpoints. And then it, and then I was like, okay, let me put my member hat on and say, you know, because I'm thinking of like the viewer, um, and you know, if 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 Great Light says this, I know I'm, as a member, their counter is going to be this. So let me say this so that Jordan can show that there's something else beyond that. And so that kind of just just evolved the whole relationship between me and Great Light um, and how we do our videos because, um, because you know, at, like normal members from the Church of God, they're not going to go on these videos and do debates. Nobody from the Church of God does a public debate. Member, pastor, none of them. Um, and so... Uh, so yeah, so it just kind of evolved from there, and it was basically it basically became me explaining the doctrine, um, and them going through showing through the context why that doctrine is not accurate, and bringing up you know other additional points like for example Sabbath day right I say well Sabbath day this is the seventh day right six days you do all your work but the seventh day is the Sabbath sure we can worship God any day but seventh day is called out as a Sabbath. And then Jordan would say something like, well, in the book of Acts, where does Apostle Paul say we need to keep the Sabbath day to go to the kingdom of heaven? In Acts, where does Apostle Paul say you need to keep the Passover to re receive eternal life? And I was like, well, shoot, you got me there. Like, <laughs> I was like, that's true. Um, and so it, that really helped in my deconstruction because already I knew the sketchy stuff the church did. I saw, you know, half of it when I was a member and the other half, you know, when I left on the examining site. But to see through the, the Bible itself, why the doctrine was incorrect um, was really a game changer because, you know, from that time up until that point, like I wasn't able to read the Bible without, you know, understanding um, how, like without having that, that church of God, you know, influence in my mind. I mean, when you see our, like, like, look at my Bible. Look how beat up it is, you guys. This is my Bible when I was in the church, okay? And then every, like, when you see, like, everything's underlined perfectly for the church doctrine. So when I try to read it, it's like, you know, I got the church of God influence um, in my mind, and it's hard for me to kind of see past. It was hard for me for, to kind of see past that. But then after, you know, meeting Great Life Studios and, uh, you know, like, essentially you know seeing the you know deconstruction of the, the doctrine through that you know and then i was able to start you know reading the bible with fresh eyes and understand now, see, it's it it's so great that you become a christian because so so many people you know turn their back on the lord and they become like i said bitter agnostics and stuff um t tell tell a little bit about the any ptsd you might have suffered because that's very common for people have right. like trauma and triggers and ptsd after coming out of this group uh, did you like your first few weeks or months out of the group what were you going through like you know think you're going to hell the first few days despair right. fear you yeah. know shame all that stuff yeah no i mean yeah actually it, it, it's it's interesting because um i had a doctor tell me not too long ago that i probably have some form of ptsd from this group even you know four years after leaving um actually i think this is going to be the fifth year after leaving and um but yeah the biggest thing that the biggest struggle i had was how to fill my time because when you're in the group like um one of the questions i would get asked a lot from the the overseer is you know at the end of every day like did you complete your mission for the day they would say like any day could be the last day any day could be when on sang hong is coming back and you where's your fruit yeah like yeah you had you, you there you had to bear so so fruit means recruit okay 
it doesn't mean like your like actions like in you know like like uh galatians chapter five it's it's not fruits of the holy spirit you're converts like, yeah you're converts and so um so you in the church from 2010 they said you had to bear 10 talents and a talent so a fruit is somebody who comes to the church and gets baptized a talent is someone who comes to the church and gets baptized who studies all the subjects who starts tithing and then who starts preaching themselves so we had to bear not just 10 fruits we had to bear 10 talents meaning we had to you know bring 10 of those kinds of people into the church and we were told directly that if you do not bear 10 talents you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven and so that puts so much stress on i mean only me but so many people for so long especially because we were told that in 2010 so that was like two years before 2012. i mean we were trying so hard to bear 10 talents from 2010 to 2012 um and it was just it, yeah it was just it was just crazy and so um so but but again you know then they said like oh it's you know we're given more time by the grace of mother so um to bring you know to, to keep trying to bear those 10 talents and yeah it was uh it was it was it was brutal and it was even more stress upon stress a lot of people have traumatic experience like moving out high demand groups like the icc shinchanji this one is pretty brutal yeah and so um when i left again you know my biggest problem was how to fill my time because you know for 10 years i you know literally believed that every single day could be the last day and you know whatever i'm doing needs to have some kind of importance um and so like whether that was you know preaching studying praying practice preaching i mean whatever it was it had to be for the church and so when i left you know even though uh well when i left it you know i still kind of believed and so um you know i thought like oh, I'm just, everything i did i'm just wasting time like if i'm watching because we weren't allowed to you know watch tv watch you know movies unless they had some kind of spiritual meaning we weren't allowed to you know listen to secular music um you know any of that stuff and so like if i wanted to watch a show like i'm wasting my time it was hard for me to enjoy simple things like that and so it and even to this day i still struggle a little bit with finding things that i like to do because i'm thinking like oh this is just a waste of time and it can be hard for me to focus but i, I would say now it's getting now it's getting significantly better but i mm. struggle with that for a long time and you know even just you know sometimes like I actually <laughs> I had to make a boundary for myself not to listen to anything World Mission Society Church of God related after a certain hour <laughs> on like a work night because that would just like increase my anxiety <laughs> I mean they would have you in your people's cars they were listening to the recordings of the new songs sometimes like some of the, the yeah. hymns they'd actually say you know you got to listen to this as you're oh, around that was, yes that was another that was another thing that i don't think i've ever mentioned before is that um you know like i said we couldn't listen to secular music so i'm i'm one of those people that i really don't like driving i get so much anxiety driving even before the church and so i would listen they, they would tell me to um listen to the new songs which is their hymns yeah. um while i'm driving and i was always afraid that if i listened to something that was not a new song that i was going to get in a car accident um i i literally thought that it was it, it was just it was in my head and it was so like listening to the uh listening to like secular music when driving was a a big thing for me after i <laughs> why well, I, I i mean actually you know i started listening to secular music in the car when i was you know kind of the tail end of my time there but um i was definitely scared of doing that <laughs> do a number on your head these guys yeah yeah so i mean i, I well, know praise god that you're walking with him now and that you want to reach out to these people yeah i mean that that's my whole you don't want them to go through it yeah i mean that's the that's the that's why i keep doing this you know why you know I, I and it's funny because like all the great light episodes like i've never asked to be on them i'm i've always been asked to be on them uh, you know so i don't actually go out actively seeking you know like oh how can i you know keep telling my story it's just you know my, my purpose has been just to you know bring awareness about this group because i lost 10 years of my life to this group and i've seen the damage that this group inflicts on p other people i mean i've seen people 
I've seen kids, you know, be convinced to, you know, drop out of school. I've seen, you know, the church tell members, you know, not to speak to their family because their family doesn't agree with the church. I, I mean, Kelsey, I see, how much money did you give in this church? We, we, we've talked about that. You gave a ridiculous amount of well, your I, I gave thousands of dollars. Thousands, I mean, well, yeah, it was about 40% of my earnings, like every paycheck. But I so time, 100% of your time, 40% of your money. Unbelievable. Yeah, and I would have given more money if I could. I would have. And so, I mean, I gave every, every, I didn't have a savings account. I gave every last dollar, I, free dollar I had to the church. Um, you know, you know that's, that's, that's one thing I say about these high demand groups. Like when you come out of Mormons and you're deceived, you're going to say, hey, I kind of blew it for five years. I was majorly deceived by this false prophet. But when you come out of a high demand group like this or some of the other ones, you say, oh my gosh, I lost 10 years of my life. I'll never get back. They're gone. You know the relationships everything it's like you really those lives are gone and i just have a little praise report and it's just like a friend of mine who uh came out of another high demand group um very recently it's another korean group shinchanji um he told me that kelsey's testimony got him out because he's in another group and they go through the same kind of crazy pressure of time and demand like this and guilt and pressure and just by watching Kelsey's testimony, he said, hey, that's what I've been going through exactly, too. And that really opened him up to uh, leave this other uh, group as well. Pretty unbelievable. Yeah, so, I mean, I've, I mean, I, I, I've, I've talked to, I've talked to people who've lost, you know, kids to this, their kids to this group, like lost communication with their kids through this group. And, um, and, you know, I don't want other people to, you know, have to go through what I went through, um, mm -hmm. you know, and, you know, the trauma after leaving. And so but that's why my main goal is just to get the information out there. And so people can make their own decisions um, because the church is not up front with all of their teachings when they bring, when they, when they baptize people, when they bring them into the church, they don't tell them most of the teachings. I mean, most of the teachings, they don't find out until after they're baptized. Like there's a whole study sheet. They might not even know An San Hong's name, they definitely don't know John Gil Jaw's name before they're baptized. They don't know that there's a you know that the church believes there's a God the Mother living in Korea. They they might not even know that the Second Coming Christ you know is An Sung Hong and he died in 1985. Um, they don't know the time commitment that's going to be required of them. They don't know the money commitment that's going to be uh, required of them. And so like I when I like towards the tail end when I was uh, of the years I was there when I was preaching like I would preach. My mouth would be talking, but my mind would be thinking, like, when, whenever somebody reacted, like, wow, that's amazing, like, yeah, I want to come to your church, my mind would be thinking, like, oh, man, like, I feel really bad because they don't know what is in store for them. They don't know what their life is going to become if, if they really become a member. And so, um, you know, so that's the, the, the impact of, of leaving. It, it's tough, but... Um, but yeah, so everything I do is, is for the, the education. And, you know, I do know a lot of people who have left and, you know, who've, who've left Christianity altogether because when you leave, you... Actually, actually, one note that I wrote down that I wanted to share is that, you know, a lot of the reason why people stay in the Church of God is because they think there's nowhere for them to go. They say, okay, I'm going to stay here because, you know, where else, like, keeps the Sabbath day? Where else keeps the Passover? right no other church keeps these things according to the bible so even though i'm not happy in the church of god this is where i'm going to stay because if i leave i'm going to go to i'm going to go to hell you know and on top of that kelsey they're they're very much into poison of the wells like the minute that you join the group they're talking so bad against us in christianity oh, yeah. saying you're babylon and you worship the sun god and everything they're poisoning yeah. everything in their thoughts like right from the get-go and you have this constant reinforced that if you leave you're going to go back to denominational Christianity and then you're going to be worshiping the sun god and yeah. worshiping the cross, which is a pagan symbol and, you know, keeping pagan holidays and go to Babylon. Everything is Babylon, Babylon, Babylon. And uh, they kind of make that in your head, like, where can I go? Yeah, yeah. And so, but but just that question, you know, where will I go if mm -hmm. I leave is enough to keep people, you know, in the group, even though they're not happy. And so... Um, so, so yeah, so like when people leave, you know, a lot of the times they just want, you know, they're, they're so like, um, like just, just burned out on church altogether because the church, 
but not only the church but the bible too because they're because you know when you're in the world mission society church of god your whole life is about you know preaching and studying the and not actually not really even studying the bible they i mean it's called you know they call it studying the bible but it's not like reading the bible all the way through or anything you're like studying that. their books you're studying their books and the the verses that they consistently refer to um so like you're so burned out from that that when you leave you really, I mean, a lot of people really want nothing to do with, you know, religion altogether. Not just Christianity, but just religion. You can't even open altogether. the Bible. Yeah, it's triggering yeah. you. Yeah, you know, and it's triggering, and, and it's triggering in, a, like, not just like a, not just like, you know, mentally, but it's triggering in a physical way. Like a lot, you know, you might have like a panic attack or an anxiety attack, you know, over because, again, you know, everything in our Bible is perfectly underlined. We go over these verses, like, thousands of times. And so even to the point where I left, you know, almost five years now, and I can still remember the verses that they use, and I can almost quote them word for word in the 1984 NIV version. You know, that's how... And they like to use the same good. verses all the time. Yeah. They kind of cherry pick. They're not like, you know, regular Christians. We read the whole Bible. They, they proof text their religion. So yeah. they kind of hear like every sermon, like, let's... You know, Revelation twenty two seventeen, Hebrews nine twenty eight. You know, you know, John six fifty three fifty four. All the time, you're hearing, hearing, hearing the same verse yeah. that just pounded your head. Yeah, and um, yeah, and actually, it's it's funny because um, for a while, um, for the, like the first half of my time in the church, they actually told us that we, you know, the Bible is not meant to be read front to back. So they actually discouraged us from reading the Bible altogether. They said we should be reading on some homes books, and you know. We have the Bible open and we follow along, but the Bible is not meant to be read, you know, fully because they are not not necessarily fully, but they just heavily discouraged it. Reading the Bible on your own because they have like this prophecy called the Root of David, and in this prophecy they teach that the only one who can interpret the Bible correctly is the Root of David, and they teach the Root of David is An Sang Hong. So only An Sang Hong's like uh, explanation of everything is valid. So they said, you know, you shouldn't try to read the Bible on your own. You should mm. be, you know, reading on Sang Hong's books, and he can, he's basically explaining the Bible to you. Because they said you wouldn't read a math book the same way you read a novel, right? In the same way, the Bible is not meant to be read, you know, front to back. It's, you know, it's basically on Sang Hong's books are the, the main book, and the Bible is like a companion. But then, that's, that's very common with cults, like the the Shinsho Ji, the promised pastor, they do that, or... With Jehovah's Witnesses, avoid independent thinking. You know, they they say if you read the Bible alone, you're going to darkness. But if you read their stuff, you're going to be in the light. It's just unbelievable. They kind of discourage. It's always that extra biblical revelation that folks go to. Yeah. So but then, speaking you know, of which, uh, mm -hmm. you guys are kind of transitioning into you know phase two. Um, uh, thank you, <coughs> thank you, Kelsey, for sharing your story. Um, thank you. 